Now we're going to begin this second breakout parallel session, which will mainly focus on protection me mechanisms in the international sphere as they relate to the protection of um, economic and social rights. Um, we have three speakers. What I will do is I'll introduce all the speakers now. Each of the speakers will speak for about 20 minutes. Um, I will be holding them very strictly to the 20 minutes. Um, so if people go over 20 minutes, what I do is I begin clapping and you should join me and I will invite the person to sit down. Um, so that's how I operate and that's how I chair. Um, in terms of the three speakers um, and three international experts that we have, um, the first speaker we'll hear from will be Dr. Parik uh, Kenna from NUI Galway, um, who is a national and international expert in housing law and housing policy, um, with his most recent text, Housing Law, Rights and Policy, um, recently published by um, Cloris Press. Uh, Parik's going to speak on the revised European Social Charter and uh, which protects social, uh, economic and social rights, um, such as right to education and right to housing. Um, and Park will speak about the role of that committee um, with a particular focus on issues of, of housing. The second speaker that we will have uh, will be uh, Roland um, Chauville. I hope I pronounce your second name correct, Roland. Um, Roland is uh, the founder and executive director of the universal, uh, UPR Info, the Universal Periodic Review. Um, an NGO dedicated to the promotion of this universal periodic review system, um, a human rights mechanism utilised by the United Nations to, uh, for states to be peer-reviewed by other states on their human rights record. And Roland will speak in particular uh, as to how Ireland um, agreed to a high proportion of the recommendations by the Human Rights Council during the... Um, U a universal periodic review process. Um, so Ron will examine and, and provide some information to us on that process, in particular as it relates to, to Ireland and Ireland's recent examination under that uh, UPR process. The third speaker who, who we met this morning um, also is Ian Byrne, who will be covering the optional protocol to the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. Um, and I know from discussing with a number of people over lunch, a protocol that is um, it is very much welcome and, and a lot of civil society organisations are very interested in and will be interested in hearing Ian's views on, um, on this international protocol. Uh, and Ian, of course, as was mentioned um, uh, early on today, is the acting head of the um, Economic, Social and Cultural Rights Team at the International Secretariat of Amnesty International. So without f further ado, I'll call on Parik now to present on the revised European so Social Charter on Irish Housing. Thank you. You're just taking this speech. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. I'm delighted to be here, to be invited by Amnesty to this very important, very important event. As far as I know, the only one in Ireland this year on economic, social and cultural rights at a time when they have never been more threatened. Now, I have been allotted this particular time known as the after-dinner slot. And it's normal to have lots of jokes for it, but I have no jokes, I'm afraid. What I'm going to do, though, is I'm going to go so fast that your eyes are going to roll around so fast in your head that you won't even think of going to sleep for the next 20 minutes. After that, I don't care what you do. Okay. okay, I'm here to speak about the European Social Charter and housing. Now, this morning we heard a lot of discussion on the different mechanisms for enforcing economic, social and cultural rights. And before I go straight into the Charter, I feel I should say a little bit about that because this is pretty much a unique system it's pretty different to a lot of the systems that we talk about generally. The general, economic, the general academic debate on human rights enforcement, especially economic, social and cultural rights, tends to revolve around constitutional rights implementation through judicial reviews in many different countries. Ironically, most of them happen to be English-speaking countries, and most of them happen to be post-colonial countries. Economic, social, and cultural rights, then, in that case law and that academic debate, has reached pretty much an impasse. There is a standoff 
you might say, between the judiciary, the executive, and the legislature. And lots of people have been writing about it and how to develop ways around it and dialogical approaches in South Africa and consultation between the executive, that is the state, and the people affected. But none of them really have come up with any great solutions to that particular problem. And in fact, it's rooted in a bigger problem, I think, which is to equate economic, social, and cultural rights entirely with civil and political rights. These mechanisms were set up initially to deal with civil and political rights, and trying to force them to deal with this much more complex area hasn't worked quite well. There's also lots of research from South American countries that this kind of individual enforcement model is used predominantly by middle class people to uh, enforce rights to health, pension rights, a whole range of things. And in fact, the people who should be using them, those who are uh, denied the basic resources, don't actually get to use them at all. So that's where we are. Now, this debate itself is often confined to constitutional lawyers, human rights lawyers, which is very interesting, and I love it. I read it, and I write about it all the time. But sometimes other people look at us in a bemusement to say, what is this about? Is this a game of pass the parcel here? Whose responsibility is it? It's not the courts. No, it's not. It's the legislature. No, it's not. It's the executive. This pass the parcel, as I call it, goes on, and the result is that the rights that were originally established don't get implemented. A better approach, I think, is to stand back one step and say, it's the state's responsibility. However you wish to define which part of the state, it is the state collectively which is responsible for giving effect to human rights. And the past the parcel arguments shouldn't really be used to stop that from developing. This, of course, approach is very common to non-lawyers, like policy or sociologists, and a whole range of people who see the state as an entity, rather than looking at the minuscule elements of the state. Which brings me to the European Social Charter. And this doesn't actually get involved at all in this debate about whether it's judges, whether it's legislature, or whether it's executive. It very much says the governments and the states take responsibility, as does international human rights, to ensure that people enjoy the rights set out in the Charter. And I'll go through some of those in a minute. And the other very important point it makes is that they will accept as the aim of their policy. Now, that's quite a key point, because we are bombarded with policy documents from everywhere, including the EU, and I've never seen the European Social Charter mentioned in any of these policy documents. So there is other avenues to, to vote this. Non-discrimination. Uh, again, all rights must be made available to people on a non-discrimination basis. The point about this, however, is that we don't talk here about individual enforcement. We're talking about the state as a collective entity. And in the context of this morning's discussion, then, on austerity, which, of course, we have to bear in mind, and the circular debates taking place about progressive realization, and the failure to define minimum core obligation, and, of course, the problem of judges deciding how to allocate the state's resources, it's very interesting to notice that in the, in the European Social Charter, there isn't any of this discussion. There are no financial constraints or limitations on any of the rights in the text of the Charter. We don't have to worry about progressive realization, minimum core obligations. There is an assumption that the 47 states of Europe have enough resources to provide these rights to everyone. Now, there recently have been some minor changes to that, where the European Committee of Social Rights had to take into account issues around social security. But generally, the principle is it's not a resource allocation problem. And therefore, we don't need to get bogged down in these debates about whether judges or legislature or executive. It's the state. Equally, there's no mention of retrogression in the Charter, which is very significant that we accept something like retrogression because it is in the UN documents, but it's not in the European Social Charter. You might say, well, that's all very fine, but of course you can't enforce the European Social Charter in a court 
I can hear you say, it's very easy to say things like there's no retrogression and there's no limitation when you don't have to go to court. But we'll come to that a bit later on, because it might not just be as it seems. Okay, there is something here which I presume you would all be aware of. Um, and I don't want to go through these in huge detail, they're in the slides. The different articles which impact on housing. I've been given a brief here to talk about housing and the revised European Social Charter, which, of course, uh, I could talk about for the whole day, but I'm limited to 15 minutes, unfortunately. And I've identified a number of these uh, which impact on housing and which have been the subject of collective complaints and reports by the committee. The rights of disabled persons, and this is something that's quite expansive. It is something that has been developed through the conclusions of the European Committee. In fact, the Council of Europe was probably for a long time the most progressive on this whole area of rights of disabled persons, which includes a right to housing. The rights of families, Article 16. And this is the one that is most litigated and the one that applies most. Families. Now, you may say, well, what about other people? Not everyone's a family. The definition of families is expansive, and it follows the uh, European Court of Human Rights definition of a family, which I suppose, if you want it to be conclusive, you would have to say the only limitation on it is it doesn't apply to any one person on their own. But even that might not actually be true, because there may be a case where a single person needs housing so they can enjoy the f access to their family members. Children. The rights of children to social protection <coughs> includes accommodation and the rights of migrant workers and their families, which is one that's generated quite a lot of reports by the Council of Europe. Article 23, the rights of older persons to social protection includes an element of adequate housing. And then in the new ones, which are the most, um, I suppose, re relevant these days, Article 30, protection against poverty and social inclusion really requires states to put in place programs and policies and budgets to ensure that everybody is protected against poverty and social exclusion, which includes housing. And then, of course, the champion of all of this, Article 31, the right to housing itself, three sections of it, not ratified by Ireland, of course. So, we don't need to talk about that, do we? Well, maybe we do, but I'll come to that in a minute. Article 15, then, disabled persons have the right to independence, social integration, to promote their full social integration and participation. Now, one of the things I was asked to, to touch on here is, what has all this got to do with Irish NGOs? It's very nice to give lectures. I do it all the time. It's very enjoyable. But what's the point of it all? And what I'm trying to say, I suppose, a little bit as I go along, here might be a link that could be used. For instance, Article 15.3, the right of disabled persons. We had a report on congregated settings last year, which showed us 4,000 people live within institutions in Ireland who are never considered for independent living or housing. Clearly, Article 15.3 would apply to those people. Article 16, the housing one, or the family one. Families and we have to use the word families, is the one that's covered. Families in poor and inadequate housing would be covered by this. For instance, traveller families. There's numerous reports, piles and piles of reports and cases, which show that traveller families live in inadequate and poor housing conditions. There isn't an argument about that, I don't think. Equally, we have, traveller, we have families who live in temporary accommodation. We have travel, families who live in um, asylum accommodation. We have families who live in local authority accommodation where their conditions are less than adequate and they're regularly reported on television and uh, in reports. So we have a whole range of housing which doesn't meet Article 16 in terms of adequacy. Uh, what does it mean? Well, we, we know from the collective complaints that uh, for Roma, excessive numbers living in substandard housing conditions Article 16 is not about conduct, but it's not, is, is about conduct and not of results. At the same time, there has to be practic practical and effective realization. What do we mean by adequacy? Structurally secure, basic amenities, water, heating, waste disposal, sanitation, electricity, suitable size, considering the composition, and secure tenure. Secure tenure is something, of course, that we know 
is now being litigated in terms of local authority tenants who don't actually have secure tenure. Traveller families don't have secure tenure. Lots of people don't have secure tenure. Uh, inadequate housing. Children, to provide protection and special aid for children, which includes housing. Now, I'm aware of time, Mr. Chairman, so I'm going to go fast. Also, I want to keep you awake as well. Um, <clears throat> migrant workers, we have lots of migrant workers here from lots of countries around the world, particularly Eastern, Central and Eastern Europe. And again, there is an obligation under Article 19 in relation to housing for migrant workers to secure for such workers lawfully within their territory, which they are by and large. No treatment, no, not less favorable than for their own nationals. Uh, for elderly persons, and of course, e, the E word is now frowned upon, but it's here, so I have to use it. Elderly persons to social protection. And uh, what does it mean? Provision of housing suited to their needs and their state of health or of adequate support for adapting their housing, adapted housing. Then Article 30, the right to protection against social exclusion and poverty. Take measures, this is the obligation on the state, state, a framework of an overall and coordinated approach to promote effective access of persons who live or risk living in social exclusion and poverty to housing and other things. In France, the conclusions of France, when France was examined by the European Committee of Social Rights, they said, by introducing this, member states considered that living in a situation of poverty and social exclusion violates the dignity of human beings. It's a pretty profound basis to this one. The measures must promote access to housing. And then Article 31, which of course doesn't matter, or does it? The most profound one, to promote access to housing of an adequate standard. Again, adequacy is the term. To prevent and reduce homelessness with a view to elimination and to make the price of housing accessible to those without adequate resources. I wonder why we didn't sign that one for some reason. <laughs> uh, access to an adequate standard, again, define adequacy in law. We have a mixed up jumble of definitions of adequacy in Irish law. We have nothing that says clearly, this is what we mean by adequate housing. Access to affordable and impartial judicial and other remedies. Not sure we'd pass that one. Uh, safe, possess all basic communities, applies to all stock and tenures, security of tenure. Reducing homelessness, again, the temporary supply of shelter, even adequate, is not satisfactory. Individuals will be provided with adequate housing within a period of time. By adequate housing, we mean permanent housing, long-term permanent adequate housing. Provide legal remedies and legal aid to those who seek redress from the courts. Again, we know there is no legal aid in property disputes as a right. Make the price of housing accessible for all those. Adequate supply of affordable housing, define affordability, <clears throat> increase the supply of social housing and make it accessible. Affordable, of course, is a very important issue. We have seen during the Celtic Tiger how the definition of affordability was changed dramatically from what it used to be about three times average incomes to including all sorts of things where economists said, but that's all ridiculous now, because if we have a low interest rate, you could have nine times your income and it's still affordable. And everybody agreed with them, including the government. But what does the Committee of Social Rights say? The committee considers housing is affordable when the household can afford to pay the initial costs on a long-term basis and maintain a minimum standard of living as defined by the society in which they're located. So it's not a minimum standard of living where you're living a basic existence. It's as defined by the society in which you're living. So what is the acceptable standard of living? That is the minimum that has to be addressed. Now, we thought we were free of Article 31, did we not? Well, I have news for you. In 2005, the European Committee of Social Rights said, actually, Article 16 and Article 31 overlap dramatically. So even if you haven't signed Article 31, it's still covered by Article 16. And that's us. That's this country here. 
In this respect, notions of adequate housing and forced eviction are identical under both. So that means, of course, that if you want to raise an Article 60 an issue around adequacy, we'll use all the materials from Article 31. I know I haven't much time. Two minutes. Two minutes. I want to talk briefly about two things. The first one is the collective complaint system, which I am here to encourage NGOs and civil society organizations to use. Ireland has accepted this procedure, and it's open to any NGO to use the range of accredited organizations across Europe to submit a collective complaint, which is effectively a complaint that the state has not given effect to the rights in the Charter. This was originally set up to strengthen the participation of organizations. 87 have taken place to date, and a good number, almost 30, have been housing related. The procedure is very simple. It's on the website. You can easily read it. I won't go through it. There's two stages. There's an admissibility, where it's decided, is it admissible, and a second stage where the merits of the case are decided. It's then submitted to the Committee of Ministers and published four weeks later by the Parliamentary Assembly. Um, 77 NGOs, INGOs, are accredited, including Amnesty. Here is the kind of complaints, a whole range of them which I don't have time to go into. Uh, some of them I have been involved in, and they've all been successful. That's the most important thing. So the kind of issues, then, that could apply in terms of a collective complaint, homeless families, families living, living in inadequate housing, families who cannot afford housing, traveler families living in inadequate housing, homeless children, housing for people with disabilities, housing for older people, housing for migrants. What is to be done? This is what I was asked to say, what is to be done? Awareness of the collective complaint system. People need to talk to each other to research and write these complaints, They're not that complex. Liaise with an international NGO, which is accredited to submit. Follow up after the submission. And most importantly, develop a social group around the complaint so that it's not just one individual presenting a complaint. And I have one last point to make. All this, of course, does not give an individual right. So what's the point? So it might seem, and up to a couple of years ago, you would have said that. But all this has changed since 2009 with the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights, which includes the right to social and housing assistance so as to ensure a decent existence. This is now part of EU treaty law in the Treaty of Lisbon. Interestingly, the explanations for the meaning of Article 34.3, what do we mean by social and housing assistance? What do we mean by decent existence? The explanations say we go and look for that in Articles 30 and 31 of the revised European Social Charter. And the last point, Mr. Chairman, it's not just enforceable, it's enforceable in every court at all levels across the whole 27 EU member states. There's no need to be involved in lengthy appeals, don't have to exhaust all the domestic remedies and then go to Strasbourg. In any district circuit high court case, this can be introduced provided there's an element of EU law involved. Thank you.